Uh, today we want to begin with the uh, problem of uh, addition of angular momentum, uh, such as arises in the coupling of the uh, spin and orbital angular momentum for a, an electron in either and through the spin orbit interactions, as I described last time. So the uh, context I'm going to uh, uh, use here is rather general, in which we have uh, two spaces, D1 and D2, uh, upon which angular momentum vectors are defined, J1 and J2. These are assumed to satisfy the standard angular momentum commutation relations. And by exponentiating them, you get corresponding rotation operators that happen in these two spaces. So in our spin orbit example, E1 could be a space of, of, of orbital wave functions uh, where the um, where the L, the um, it's only the magnetic quantum number is variable, so you have a 2L plus 1 dimensional space. And the other quantum number is in, in the L of this. Uh, and then E2 would be the space of the spin of the particle, which of course also involves just a simple angular momentum. So since these spaces both have uh, actually rotation operators defined on them, uh, they also possess a standard angular momentum basis, which in the, these two cases we'll call J1, N1, and J2, N2. The J1 and J2 are just fixed numbers that describe the space, E1 and E2. In particular, the dimension of the space is 2J1 plus 1 and 2J2 plus 1. Only M1 and M2 are variable when we define the basis vectors. The third space is the tensor product of the first two spaces. Uh, the angular momentum on that space is the sum of the two other angular momenta. Uh, you can easily check that the, if J1 and J2 satisfy the standard angular momentum commutation relations, then so does total J. Part of the proof of that is, is that the cross commutators between J1 and J2 are zero. J1 and J2 commute with each other. That is, all three components of these two operators commute with each other. And the reason is that they act on different spaces, one in this space and the other in that space. The dimensionality of the product space is the product of the dimensions. And a basis in the product space is the product of the basis vectors in the constituent spaces. This particular uh, basis in this case is something that I'll call the uncoupled basis uh, to distinguish it from uh, the coupled basis, which is coming up in a moment. Anyway, this gives the setup of the, effectively the linear algebra the problem of, of addition of angular momentum. Now, uh, the main goal here is to find the standard angular momentum basis on the product space. That standard, standard angular momentum basis is going to be definition of the standard angular momentum basis. It's a simultaneous eigenbasis of the operators J squared and J C. Yes? Um, I have a question about what you were saying about the J values being fixed. Yes. So we're talking about spin and orbital angular momentum. And up until now, we've kind of been talking about spin as a fixed one. Yes. But having the L value for orbital angular, angular momentum be specified, and I mean, I guess be variable, and then be specified in various circumstances? The, uh, the, the space of orbital wave functions is, of course, much bigger than the space of spin wave functions because it's infinite dimensional. But it does have a standard angular momentum basis. If, if we were talking about hydrogen, we'd write it like this as NLM. And um, so, in a sense, uh, the problem that occurs in hydrogen is not the product of a space like this with a spin space, but rather the whole orbital space times a spin space. However, the orbital space can be decomposed into orthogonal subspaces that are characterized by N and L. These are kind of what, I, what I've been calling the irreducible subspaces. Those are irreducible subspaces, a space of dimension, in this case, of 2L plus 1, in which the vectors are related by raising, raising and lowering operators and indexed by them. So we do a divide and conquer in the bigger space. We split it up into these okay. and do it one at a time. Okay. That's actually sufficient. All right. So. Uh, so, uh, the, um, uh, so the so uh, to repeat the standard angular momentum basis. Thank you for that question, by the way. That was a point that really needed, needed to be made. Uh, so, to repeat the standard angle, what we're going to look for is a standard angular momentum basis in the product space. And as I say, this will be eigenstates of j squared and j z. So, uh, let's call the quantum numbers of those j and m like this, without any one and two subscripts, as you see in the other spaces. Uh, and uh, a priori, we don't actually know whether or not these simultaneous eigenstates of these two operators might be degenerate. Uh, if they were, in addition to the quantum numbers J and M, we, needed, we, needed, we would need an additional one, which I've been calling gamma in a general context. Gamma is, it, it can be identified with uh, the N, which occurs here in the case of the hydrogen atom. Uh, but as it turns out, we'll see, we won't need the extra index gamma, and so I won't bother to carry it around. It turns out that the simultaneous eigenstates of these two operators are, in fact, non-degenerate. 
Uh, so what this gives us is a second basis, the standard angular momentum basis, which I'll also call the coupled basis, because it's the uh, angular momentum basis uh, of the combined angular momentum of the two subsystems, like this. So there's actually two bases on this space, the uncoupled basis and the coupled basis. This is the idea here. All right. Now, to find the eigenvectors of the coupled basis, we need to find the eigenvectors of J squared and JZ. JZ is a simpler operator, so let's start with that first. Uh, the first thing to say is, is that if I take JZ, it turns out that all of the vectors of the uncoupled basis are automatically eigenvectors of JZ. And that's easy to show because if I let JZ act on vector J1, J2, M1, M2, uh, that is just an abbreviation. Well, first of all, the JZ, what does that mean? JZ means J1Z plus J2Z, just the Z component of the sum of the two angular momenta. And this, uh, uh, this uncoupled basis vector is the same as the product of the basis vectors J1, M1, times J2, M2. That's a definition of, of this more compact notation for the uh, uncoupled basis vectors. And in this final expression, the J1Z acts on the J1, M1 cat, and the J2Z acts on the J2, M2 cat. They act on different spaces. First one brings out the eigenvalue m1, the second one brings out the eigenvalue m2. I'll set h bar equals 1 here uh, for, to save writing. And so the result is, is that this becomes m1 plus m2 uh, times the product states j1 m1 uh, times j2 m2. And let's write this as just simply m times j1 j2 m1 m2 going back to our other notation for the uh, vectors of the uncoupled basis, where uh, uh, m is equal to uh, m1 plus m2. And so this just shows what I claim, is that all the vectors of the uncoupled basis are automatically eigenvectors of jz, with an eigenvalue which is the sum of the two m quantum numbers. It's called m, the total magnetic quantum number. jz is what you call an additive quantum number, so it just adds up when we take uh, products of states like this. All right. Now then, um, to uh, proceed with this, I think it helps to have an example. Uh, let me take the example in which j1 is equal to 5 halves and j2 is equal to 1. This means that 2j1 plus 1, which is the dimension of the first space, is equal to 6, and 2j2 plus 1, the dimension of the second place, is equal to 3. And so the dimension of the product space, which I'm calling e here, is 6 times 3, which is 18. We'll be dealing with an 18 dimensional space now. Uh, to uh, visualize the vectors of the uncoupled basis, they're indexed by m1 and m2. m1 goes from minus j1 to plus j1, m2 goes from minus j2 to plus j2. To visualize those vectors, allow me to make a plot of them in the m1 and m2 plane, because that's how they're labeled by. So m2, or m1, here, excuse me, goes from minus 5 halves and plus 5 halves. So I'll try to draw this as accurately as possible. If that's 1, that's 2, that's 3, then 5 halves is right there. That's 5 halves of the M1 axis. And then M2 goes from minus 1 to plus 1. So that's minus 1, 0, and plus 1. So let's make a, a dot here, a dot there, and a dot there. And then, oh, by lowering M1, we have dots here, here, and here. And then at 1 half, like this. And then at minus 1 half, like this. And then at minus 3 halves like this, and then finally at minus 5 halves. And the result is we get a rectangular array of, of spots on the M1 and M2 plane, each of which represents a vector of the uncoupled basis. This vector over here on the upper right-hand corner is what I'll call the doubly stretched state. In this case, it's the product of the stretched state for the number 1 subspace times the stretched state for the number 2 subspace, which is 5, 5, uh, a product with 1, 1. As, as I say, that's a double stretch state. The one in the other corner is the stretch state in the opposite direction, in which the ends go to the m minus 5 halves and minus 1. Like this. So you have this, this array. Now, each of these spots in the array, as I said, corresponds to a vector of the uncoupled basis. And each of those vectors is an eigenvector of Jz, as you see up here. Uh, and the eigenvalue is m1 plus m2, which we're calling capital, which we're calling just, just m, not capital M, but just m, no subscript, like this. Uh, if we uh, draw the contour lines of m in the m1, m2 plane, they're simply straight lines that go down at a 45 degree angle, like this. 
And in particular, if I draw the line that goes through this double spec state like this, this is the line in which m is equal to seven halves. If I move down by one, there's another line here that goes through these two states in which m is equal to five halves. Another line that goes through three states has m equals three halves. There's another one that goes through these three states which has m equals one half. One that goes through these three has m equals minus a half. One goes through these three has m equals minus three halves. One goes through these two and has m equals uh, and minus five halves. And then finally, there's one that goes through the last oppositely or anti stretch state as minus seven halves. And so you can see that the m values, which are allowed, uh, range from minus seven halves up to plus seven halves. You can also see, so these are the eigenvalues of J sub Z. You can also see that some of these eigenvalues are degenerate. For example, if n equals 5 halves, there are actually are two vectors that have that same eigenvalue, J Z, although the stretch state is non-degenerate. And then you get further down, you get further over degeneracy because there's three states. In fact, allow me to make a table here. We'll make a plot here of the total value of M, which range, ranges from 7 halves, 5 halves, 3 halves, 1 half, minus a half, minus three halves, minus five halves, minus seven halves, grand total of eight values. And that will be offered some totals coming up in a minute. The first thing that we do is to, is to make, a, gra uh, make a, a table of what I call G of N, which stands for the degeneracy of the JZ quantum number. So for seven halves, it's only one full degenerate because there's only one state. For five halves, there's two states. Uh, for three halves, there's three states, one, two, three. And it goes down like this, three, 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 two, one. Those are the degeneracies of the different uh, total magnetic quantum number values. If you add these numbers up, you'll get 18. And you have to because the array is a, is a six by three array of spots. That's this 2j1 plus one times 2j2 plus one up there. It's the same thing, six times three equals 18. All right. Now, uh, the, uh, this gives us the eigenstates of JZ. What about the simultaneous eigenstates of JZ and J squared? That's what we really want. Uh, to, to analyze that question, let's start with a doubly stretched state right there. A doubly stretched state is uh, 5 halves, 5 halves, times 1, times 1, 1, like this. And we know that JZ acts on it and brings out the eigenvalue of 7 halves, 5 halves, 5 halves, 1, 1. This. <coughs> now, I want to remind you of a theorem that we discussed at the beginning of the semester. I think it was 1.5. It said that if you have a non degenerate eigenstate at one observable, and if that observable commutes with the second observable, then it's automatically an eigenstate of the second observable. Uh, this applies in the present case because we have a non degenerate eigenstate of JZ, and JZ, of course, commutes with J squared. So uh, the result is, is that this non-degenerate eigenstate of Jz must also be an eigenstate of J squared. So we must have, uh, so the, the result is, is that this state here, 5 has 5 has 1, 1, we must be able to write it in the form of some J with an M value, which is 7 halves, as you see. So some J it must be possible to write it like this. And then we have j squared act on the state j7 halves. This is, of course, going to bring out j times j plus 1 times j7 halves. Now, the argument and that theorem don't tell us what the eigenvalue is. It just tells us that it is an, eigen, an eigenvector of that operator. What is the eigenvalue of j here? We can get the answer in the following way. Uh, we know that the magnetic quantum number has a maximum value of j. So that means that 7 halves is less than or equal to j. In other words, j must, whatever j value there is, it must be greater than or equal to 7 halves by the rules of the magnetic quantum numbers. So let's uh, to, to, to try a guess here. Could we try, say, j equals 9 halves? Is that a poss possibility? Could this state be, this double stretch state, could it be the nine, a 9 halves, 7 halves state? Is that possible? Well, the answer is no, because if I applied a raising operator to it, it would convert it within a constant factor into a state that had 9 halves, 9 halves. In other words, it would, it would raise the J value by, excuse me, the M value by 1. And we have a state that had total M equals to 9 halves. 
But there are no states with A equals 9 and 7 pounds is the maximum, as you can see here from the table and from the diagram. And so this is impossible, and so is the J equals 9 halves. The result is that J cannot be greater than 7 halves, and so in fact the real condition is that J is equal to 7 halves. And the result is, the result of this is, is that this J becomes equal to 7 halves, and we can write this in the double stretch state, 5 halves, 5 halves, times 1, 1, is equal to uh, 7 halves, 7 halves, like this, where the final numbers are J1, M1 here, J2, M2 here, and J, M here. And what you see now is that we have one vector of the standard angular momentum basis on the, uh, on the product space, which is a product, it's a stretch double stretch state. All right. Now, uh, so let me put a, so let me put up here J equals 7 halves occurs, and let me put a 1 here to correspond to that 1, which was the double stretch state. Now, if I can take that double stretch state and apply lowering operators to J minus, I can create all states that go from 7 halves down to 7 halves comma minus 7 halves by lowering the magnetic quantum number in the two steps. And that corresponds to this table to one state here, one state there, one there, one there, one there, one there, and one at the bottom, adding them up, or just marking them off. And if you add, add them up, in fact, that's a total of eight states. Okay. So, um, let me erase the space here. I'm going to need it in a minute. Um, that can be really good. Let me use the space here. Now let's take a look at the next eigenspace of J sub Z bound, in which J sub Z total is equal to 5 halves. This is a two dimensional space, and it's spanned by the two vectors of the uncoupled basis that I've drawn here. If I draw a, a two dimensional diagram of the Hilbert space, that is to say the subspace, eigenspace of JZ, it's a span by the states 5 halves, uh, 3 halves, times 1, 1, and also by the state 5 halves, 5 halves, times uh, 1, 0. These are the, these are the two, two spots that I've circled here. So this is a, a schematic diagram of a two dimensional space. Now, when I took this stretch state, which was uh, 7 halves, 7 halves from Jn, and we apply a J minus to it, this will give us the state 7 halves, 5 halves, with an M value of equal to 5 halves. And that's a, that will also be a vector of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the standard angular momentum basis. And since M equals 5 halves, it lies inside this two dimensional space, and it must be a linear combination of those two. So somewhere pointing off in this direction, if I can just do this schematically here, is the vector 7 halves, 5 halves. All right. Now, allow me to define the vector orthogonal to this. Let's just call it x, because it's something that is unknown for the time being. But let's make it orthogonal to that in that space. So what do we know about x? First of all, it's orthogonal to 7 halves, 5 halves. Secondly, we know that x, since it lies in this m equals 5 half subspace, is an eigenstate of jz, so jz acting on x is equal to 5 halves times x. We know that also. All right. Now, it turns out that this x is also an eigenstate of j squared. You see this this way. Let's take j squared acting on x and consider that as a vector. And then let's let jz act on the product. Now, since jz commutes with j squared, I can bring it past the j squared. It will act on the x and bring up a value of 5 halves. So this becomes 5 halves times j squared acting on x. And thus, j squared acting on x is another vector, which is an eigenvector of jz with eigenvalue 5 halves. Therefore, it must lie inside this plane. And so, J squared acting on X must be a linear combination of any two orthogonal vectors. I won't choose those two on the uncoupled basis. Let me choose these two. So it must be a linear combination. Let's write this way: as A times X plus D times uh, seven times five halves. Seven times five halves. Write it, write it correctly. Like this. All right. Now, allow me to take this final equation and multiply it as a bra by 7 halves, 5 halves on the, from the left. When I do, the j squared can act on the left on this state, 
which we know is an eigenstate of j squared, and it will bring out 7 halves times 7 halves plus 1. What's left over is 7 has 5 has scalar product of x, but that's in fact 0. So the left hand side gives me 0. On the right hand side, I get 7 has 5, I get coefficient a. 7 has 5 has scalar product of x, again, that's equal to 0. And then finally, what I get is b, multiplying the square of 7 has 5 has, which is 1, assuming it's normalized. And so we conclude that the coefficient b is 0. So this term goes away. And the important point here is, is that j squared acting on x is a multiple of x, and therefore x is an eigenvector of j squared. This is actually a simple generalization of that, that theorem of, uh, that, that theorem was proven in fact in the, in the first set of notes. All right. So this vector, which I'm calling x, has a value of jz, which is 5 halves, and it's also an eigenstate of j squared. So if we can write, so let's write it this way, if I can find some room to do it. Let's write it this way. Let's write x is equal to j and 5 halves for some unknown value of j. And the question is, what is the value of j? Well, first of all, j must be greater than or equal to 5 halves because 5 halves is the, because j is the maximum value of m. So uh, to take a case, let's ask ourselves, could j be equal to, let's say, 7 halves? Is that a possibility? Or 9 halves or anything? Let's look at 7 halves, some number that's greater than 5 halves. Well, if this x state were a state that had j equals 7 halves, then you see it would be the same quantum numbers we have here for the state we got by lowering. We'd have two linearly independent states with the same quantum numbers. You'd need an extra index to resolve the degeneracy if that were the case. But let's suppose for the sake of argument that the, both those states have the same quantum numbers under j, j squared and jz. Then by applying raising operators, so that would be then spanning the space, then by, by applying raising operators, I convert them into a pair of linearly independent vectors that had 7 half 7 halves up here on the m equals 7 half state. But that's a one-dimensional space, not a two-dimensional space. There's only one vector like that. So we can't have two linearly independent vectors with the same value of, of uh, j equals 7 halves. So this turns out to be impossible. And so in fact, this way you can eliminate all values of j that are greater than 5 halves. And the result is it must be equal to 5 halves. And so our vector x, I can now write it this way as 5 halves, 5 halves. It's the stretch state of another, of another uh, irreducible subspace, now with a j value of 5 halves instead of 7 halves. So on our table here, it looks like this. We have another value, j equals 5 halves, which occurs here. There's one vector lying in this two-dimensional space. And then by lowering it down until we get minus 5 halves, we get a set of six vectors like this. Now we move on to the third space down. This one here is three-dimensional. And uh, by using a similar argument, we find that there is a single vector in this space orthogonal to these other two, and it has a value of j equals three halves. In fact, it's a stretch state of that multiplet. And we lower it goes down by using lowering operators and we get a grand total of four. And at this point, all the dimensions have been used up. Three here is equal to one plus one plus one, as you see. So that's the end of it. In fact, if you add up down to the bottom, we get the dimensions 18 is 8 plus 6 plus 4. And the result is, is that in this case, we see that the product of these two spaces with these values of j1 and j2 consists of three irreducible subspaces under rotations with the angular momentum values 3 halves, 5 halves, and 7 halves. Moreover, they occur only once, so there's no need for an extra index to resolve the genesis. That, um, what this means is, is that um, the, um, uh, that, 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 uh, that this is, uh, this now gives us a complete specification of the couple basis, at least in, the, in this numerical example I've, I've, uh, I've given up here. This is sometimes written this way in a, in a notation for this. We'd say that if we took five halves and formed the tensor product with one, what we get is 3 halves, and then a direct sum with 5 halves, and a direct sum with 7 halves. This is a shorthand notation for the tensor product of the corresponding ket spaces. And only the j values are indicated here. So it's like the E1 plus E2, which is over here on this board. 
Uh, and as far as this direct sum here, I'll remind you the direct sum refers to the decomposition of the space into orthogonal subspaces. That's how we're using it. And these correspond to the three different J values. There's three different orthogonal subspaces of dimensions 8, 6, and 4 inside this product space. And that's what the right-hand side means. And this uh, notation here for the decomposition of the product space corresponds to the dimension count, which is 6 times 3, which is equal to 4 plus 6 uh, plus 8. Check on the dimensions. This argument that I've just been through for these specific values of J1 and J2 can be generalized to arbitrary values. And if you do, what you find is, is that the total J takes on a, goes from the minimum value, which is the absolute value of J1 minus J2, and in integer steps up to a maximum value, which is J1 plus J2. And for each one of the J values that occurs in this list, the magnetic quantum numbers run from minus J to plus J. Because it's a complete uh, irreducible subspace. Uh, what this means is that if I do the sum, where J ranges from a minimum, which is absolute value J1 minus J2, up to a maximum, which is J1 plus J2, and then an M sum, where M goes from minus J up to plus J, well, we not even do the M sum because the result of the M sum is 2J plus 1. That's the dimensionality of each of these J subspaces. This must be equal to the product 2J1 plus 1 times 2J2 plus 1. And this is a, an algebraic relation which you can check by, by just ordinary algebra. And, and what it is is, it, is it's, a, it's a check on the dimension count of, of, this, of these rules. These are the, these are the rules for the com combination of angular momenta telling you the, the j's that come out. This is an example of it up here, the numbers we're looking at in a specific example. All right. Now. So that's the idea. And uh, it gives the right uh, dimension count. Now. Uh, the result is that we have two bases on the product space, what I'm calling the uncoupled basis, uh, which is, which I'm writing this way, is J1, J2, M1, M2, and this is just shorthand for the product defined to be J1, M1 times J2, M2. And also, we also have what I'll call the couple basis, which is JM. And by the way, in the uncoupled basis, the J1 and J2 are fixed, and M1 and M2 range between minus J1 plus J1 minus J2 plus J2. Whereas in the couple basis, J is not fixed. J has a range which is given uh, uh, right up there. And for each value of J, the M uh, runs from minus J plus J. But in any case, these are two different bases. The number of basis vectors is the same as the dimension of the space, 18 in the example we were looking at. And so there is a unitary, uh, there's a unitary transformation that connects us from one basis to the other. And the unitary the components of the unitary matrix that carry out the, the transformation are just the scalar products of the basis vectors from one space with the basis vectors from another space. These are the scalar products looking like this. <coughs> uh, these scalar products, or you can go in the other direction, J1, J2, M1, M2, and Jm, if you, uh, if you wanted to uh, take the emission conjugate of the, of the unitary matrix. Uh, these uh, matrix elements are called the flex burden coefficients. Uh, now, uh, actually, Fletcher and Gordon were mathematicians who worked on uh, in problems of invariance uh, several decades before the advent of quantum mechanics. So they had nothing to do with the use of this in quantum mechanics. And in fact, uh, attaching their name to these coefficients is a little misleading in terms of what they actually did. But they actually, the most important thing they did was to work out these rules here for how angular momenta combine when you take product spaces. Uh, but anyway, it's common to call these uh, uh, clutch burden coefficients. People that are fastidious about credit sometimes get call these vector coupling coefficients instead. And they refer to that as the clutch burden series. It's probably more accurate historically to do that. Uh, in any case, the clutch burden coefficients are merely these, uh, uh, merely these components of the unitary matrix connecting the two bases. 
Now, uh, I'm going to assume that you've had experience in calculating flex Gordon coefficients by raising and lowering operators. And if you, hadn't, if you haven't, I suggest you do a practice of a one half cross one or something like that. Uh, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to lecture on that. Uh, I will, however, say some things about the properties of the, of the flex Gordon coefficients. So uh, here's what they are. The first one is, is that they're real. Uh, the fact that they're real is not automatic. It follows from phase conventions that are used in defining the Gordon coefficients. Uh, these uh, states that are being produced here are only defined in the eigenstate. Eigenstates of any inside of operators are only defined within a phase. But there are reasonable phase conventions one can come up with. The standard ones are, are, are called the condom and shortly phase conventions. And they guarantee that the clutch Gordon coefficients are real. So in fact, these two versions, where one is, is a complex conjugate of the other, in fact, are numerically equal in the case of the flex Gordon coefficients. The second property I want to mention is the orthonormality properties. And this just, uh, just has to do with the uh, fact that these are, uh, are connecting two orthonormal bases. So for example, there's really two orthonormality properties. Here's one of them. If I sum up M1 and M2, this is summing over the basis vectors of the uncoupled basis. And I have the clutch Gordon coefficient of J1 at Jm, scalar product of J1, J2, M1, M2. And then another one, which is the scalar product of J1, J2, M1, M2. We call it J prime, M prime, like this. Uh, you can see that this is the resolution of the identity in which the uncoupled basis has been inserted between the scalar product of two basis vectors and the coupled basis. And so it's just by working with only a couple of bases, it's just prime for delta sim and prime and delta jj prime and delta and e prime. Conversely, there's a sum of the other way, the sum on j and m, uh, and let's make it j1, j2, m1, m2, uh, scalar product of jm for the first clutch Gordon coefficient. The second one is jm scalar product of j1, j2, m1 prime, m2 prime, like this where the range on the summation of j's is this one here, like this, and where the summation on m is going from minus j to plus j. Uh, well, you can see this is just a resolution of the identity using the coupled basis, and what's left over is a scalar product of two vectors of the uncoupled basis. So this is product or delta m1 m1 prime times product or delta m2 m2 prime. These formulas are really very obvious if you think about uh, insertions of resolution to the identity. All right, anyway, that's the orthonormality. The third property I want to mention is the selection rule. And the selection rule really comes from the fact that this JZ is an additive quantum number. I'll write it out right here. The selection rule is, is that the clutch Gordon coefficient J1, J2, M1, M2, scalar product of JM, equals zero unless m is equal to m1 plus m2. And that is, as I say, simply because jz is an additive quantum number, so the total jz value must be equal to the sums of the jz values on the other side, or else it's zero. Okay, those are the three main properties of the clutch Gordon coefficients that will be important for us. All right. Now, let me show you some things you can do with the flex square coefficients. It's interesting to mix them up with rotation operators, which is what I'm going to do now. Uh, let's take a vector of the uncoupled basis, J1, J2, M1, M2. And let's expand it as a linear combination of vectors of the coupled basis, so I need to sum on J and M. And essentially, you do this just by inserting a resolution of the identity immediately before the vector in question up front. So it becomes J and M outer product of itself times the original vector, which is J1, J2, M1, M2. And so you see the vectors of one basis are the vectors of the other basis with clutch word and linear combinations with clutch word as coefficients as the coefficients of the expansion. So it's rather simple stuff. Now, I'd like to take this formula. I could do it the other way, too. You can solve for Jm in terms of the, the coupled basis vectors in terms of the uncoupled ones. But this will lead, lead me where I want to go for the next step. 
Now let me take uh, I'd like to take this equation on both sides and apply a rotation. In fact, there's really three rotations here. All of them are on the same axis and angle. Let me call the first one u1, again, n half of theta. This is the same thing as e to the minus i over h bar uh, times theta times n hat dotted into j1. Let me write u2 if n hat of theta is the same thing except one replaced by two. This acts on the number two cat space. And then let's talk about an overall rotation operator, u of n hat comma theta, that acts on both spaces. And uh, this is uh, this can be defined as e to the minus i over h bar times theta times n hat dotted into total j. It's each for each space. You use the angular momentum vector that's appropriate for the given space. However, total j is the sum of j1 plus j2. So this final expression here looks like e to the x plus y. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an exponential operator, so it looks like this. And moreover, the x and y operators commute with each other because j1 and j2 act on different spaces. And if that's true, then an exponential like this behaves just like it follows the rules of ordinary numbers. So this is the same thing as e to the x times e to the y. And the result is, is right, if j is equal to j1 plus j2, this factors and just becomes u1 of n hat comma theta times u2 of n hat comma theta. The overall rotation operator, in other words, is just the product of the rotations on the, on the subspaces. Uh, excuse me, the constituent spaces of the, of the product space. All right. For shorthand, we'll just call this u1, the first one u1, the second one u2, and the third one u. But it's understood they're all, they all have the same axis and angle. All right. Now, uh, the equation in the box up here is a, is a vector equation in the product space. So the rotation operator we have to use is u. I'd like to apply u to both sides of this equation, u on the left side. I'll, use, I'll write it as u on u2 on the left side, and I'll just take it as u on the right side. So let's apply the, these rotations on the two sides. Uh, allow me to start with the left side here, uh, u1, u2, uh, acting on j1, m1, times j2, m2, like this. Uh, where I've, I've rewritten this product of, of vector in terms of the vectors that, that it's a product of. Now the u1 acts on the first factor and the u2 acts on the second factor. And except for one exchange of subscripts one and two, it's really the same calculation. So let's look at u1 acting on j1 m1. What is that equal to? Uh, well, we can answer this by making a, a resol inserting a resolution of the identity here right before the u. Let's write it this way. It's the sum on, on uh, m1 prime times j1 m1 prime uh, times j1 m1 prime u j1 m1, like that. <coughs> and I don't need a sum on j1 because j1 is just a fixed number on the basis of u1, besides the u is diagonal in j's. But the final matrix solvent that occurs here is a D matrix. This can be written this way as the sum on m1 prime of j1 m1 prime times the D matrix, j1 upstairs, m1 prime, m1 downstairs. And it will be understood that the D matrix is parameterized by the same axis and angle as the U's, the, either any of the U's, the same in and theta. All right. And of course, I'll get something similar to the U2 acting on J2. So applying then U1 and U2 to the left-hand side here, let me write it out in a place where I can write the whole thing out is we get the sum on m1 prime, m2 prime of j1, j2, m1 prime, m2 prime, d, j1, m1 prime, m1, d, j2, m2 prime, m2, is equal to the rotated version of the right-hand side. Well, on the right-hand side, we have u acting on one of the standard angular momentum bases of the, of the product space, Jm. And so the calculation I just went through just applies again, except I just dropped the one subscripts. So u acting on Jm gives me a sum on an index m prime and another d matrix. So the right-hand side looks like this. I'm not going really to write it out. It becomes a sum on Jm and m prime on basis vectors Jm prime 
the D matrix D J M prime M, and then there's the Clutch Gordon coefficient J M J1 J2 M1 M2. This. Okay. So this is rotating both sides of this expansion. Now, uh, I'd like to pick up the term that involves the product of the D matrices. So I want to get rid of this vector, which is here. So let's multiply through by a broad J1, J2, uh, M1 prime, M2 prime. Really picks out a single term in the series on the left-hand side. And if we do, then we get this result, which is the product of two D matrices. We'll get the product of two D matrices as a linear combination of single D matrices. So it looks like this. Is that D J1 M1 prime M1 D J2 M2 prime M2 is equal to the sum on J, M, and M prime of the vector J, uh, 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 J, the vector J1, J2, M1 prime, M2 prime is given a product of J, M prime times the E matrix B, J, M prime, M times the other clutch for coefficient J, M, scalar product of J1, J2, M1, M2 get this result. So this shows that the product of D matrices can be represented as a linear combination of other D matrices uh, in which the J values that occur are determined by the rules for adding angular momentum of J1 plus J2. By the way, it's possible to invert this to get the single D matrix as a lin linear combination of products of D matrices with with other J's, and you could, you could set it up so you can get lower J's. You can use this as a matter of fact to build up the D matrices for higher values of J's once you know them for lower J's. For example, if J1 and J2 are one half, in which case we know what the D matrices are, you can use this plus a table of clutch Gordon coefficients to get the D matrices for J equals one, and so on. That's, this is one of the ways of building up the D matrices. In any case, I for my purpose today, I want to use it in this form. Um, I'm heading somewhere with this sort of formula, which is that we'd like to connect this with YLMs. Let me remind you that the YLM of theta and phi is equal to the square root of 2L plus 1 over 4 phi times the D matrix, D matrix DLM0 of Euler angles phi, theta, and 0 of X conjugate. Useful relation between the two. Uh, so I'm going to convert this formula into a formula involving YLMs. In order to do that, I need to have the second index of the D matrices be zero. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for doing this uh, on the board, but it saves some writing and the details are all contained in the notes. I'm going to go through this equation and swap the M and M primes just to convert it because it's slightly more convenient if I do that. So let me, let me use my fingers. I'll change all M's into M primes and vice versa. Sum that to leave alone. This becomes unprimed here, that becomes unprimed, and then M prime gets swapped there, and all these things be prime. Let's do that. Now, the, the next thing I'm going to do with my fingers is to set uh, the special case M prime 1 equals M prime 2 equals 0 because I want to get zeros in the second indices here. So it'll look like YLMs. So if I set M1 prime and M2 prime equal to 0, I'll run through and do that here and here like this. And then these two become 0, 0 over here on this clutch Gordon coefficient. Now, however, by the selection rules of the clutch Gordon coefficient, if M1 and M2 are equal to 0, these are the prime ends, then the total end prime has to be 0 also, or else this clutch Gordon coefficient vanishes. So the sum on M prime only involves a single term, which M prime equals 0. So let me replace this by a zero, put a zero there, and then put a zero here. And we're going to drop that sum in the front. Okay? Now, next, as long as I'm using my fingers to erase things, let's turn L's, J's into L's, so it'll look like uh, YLMs. I'll just uniformly run through it like L's instead of J's. 
this becomes L1, L2. This is an L. This J turns into an L. This J turns into an L. This J turns into an L. And these two L1 and L2, like this. So you see we're getting there. Uh, let me complex conjugate both sides. Since the touch Gordon coefficients are real, I don't need to do anything to them. And now, apart from the factors of the square root of 2 L plus 1 over 4 pi, I've got what I need to, to express this in terms of YLMs. So I'll show you what you get when you do this. You should get Y L1 in 1 in some position theta in 5 times Y L2 in 2 in some position theta in 5 is equal to the sum on L and M. In fact, L ranges from the absolute value of L1 minus L2 up to the sum of L1 plus L2. And the M runs as usual from minus L up to plus L. Then we've got two plus Gordon coefficients, L1, L2, M1, M2, times L. Excuse me. Before I do that, there's a square root factors to come in. Let me write that down first. When you work that out, they turn into this. The square root of 2L1 plus 1 times 2L2 plus 1 divided by 4 pi times 2L plus 1. And then there's the first flat square root coefficient, which is uh, L1, L2, M1, M2, square root product of LM. Then there's a Y of LM, theta M5, from the middle B matrix here. And then there's a final last flat square root coefficient, which is L1, well, it's, it's, a, it's a L0, square root product of L1, L2, 0, 0, like this. Okay, we get this formula. Yeah. Now, a comment about this formula is that in the first place, the YLMs that form a complete orthonormal set of functions on the sphere. So you, you can expand any function as a linear combination of YLMs. And if you take the product of two YLMs, of course, you have a function on the sphere which can be expanded. And what this shows you is explicitly what the expansion coefficients are. There's some square root factors and then a product of two clutch Gordon coefficients. Well, this turns out to be very useful in applications, which is why I'm uh, writing it down. To put this in a slightly different form, let's take YLM of theta and phi, which occurs on the, the right-hand side, multiply through by the complex conjugate and integrate. Let's do the integral over solid angles of YLM complex conjugate. And if we do that, we get an integral on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we pick out a single term LM, so the y LM drops out, and so does the sum. And so you get this formula here, which is essentially the same formula. So the integral on the solid angle of y LM star times y L1 M1 times y L2 M2 is equal to everything else on the right-hand side, the same square root as above, and times the same plus square root coefficients L1, L2, M1, M2, LM, times the plus square root coefficient L1, L2, 0, 0, like this. We get this formula. And we'll use this more than once, we'll call this the 3 YLM formula. It allows you to do an integral. Uh, you see it of a product of three YLMs getting answers in terms of touch board limitations. Okay. Now, this is all I want to say about the problem of addition of angular momenta, and I'd like to turn now to a new topic, which is the transformation property of operators under rotations. Let's make a start on it. Uh, Again, let's suppose we have a, a cat space for some physical system, and let's let aside the state in this. And let's suppose that we have rotation operators that act on this cat space. Uh, then it's possible to define the rotating space I'll call psi prime, which is our rotation operator U of R acting on psi, where R is a classical rotation. And I'll say again that we're only talking about proper rotations for now. Parity is an improper rotation. We'll deal with that later. Uh, I'll remind you also that for half integer angular momenta, this is only defined within a sign. There's actually two such operators. Now, in addition to, to saying how uh, states transform under rotations, we'd like to have, have a way of talking about how operators transform under rotations. 
So if A is, is an old operator and A prime is the ro rotated operator, the question is what should be the definition of the rotated operator? The definition that we will adopt is that the uh, expectation value of the rotated operator in the rotated state should be equal to the expectation value of the original operator, which I'll call A. This is some function of A. The original operator in the original state. In other words, we require this. Is that psi prime sandwiched around A prime should be equal to psi sandwiched around A. This is going to be our definition of A prime. However, since psi prime is u times psi, the left-hand side is psi u dagger a prime u psi. And since these have to be equal for all choices of space, this implies that u dagger a prime u is equal to a. Uh, or if we bring the u's and u daggers over to the other side, then the answer to our question as to the definition of the rotated operator is that it should be our rotation operator u of r times a times u of r dagger, like this. So this is a definition of the rotated operator. Okay, so we'll uh, take up from there next time.